do is you just re-implement the macros until you have all the macros that you need, and you now, you now have your return to payload against that certain DLL. So it's, it's manual, yes, but it takes like, you know, a half hour. I don't care. Uh, so here's an example of how a macro works. You know, I, I just make it a simple Ruby function, and what it does is it returns an array of uh, the instructions that it needs, you know, and with the, the values in line, because those values get turned into 32-bit 30 32-bit constants, and just returns the, you know, the sub-program that implements that operation, so you can call it from your main program. So here's kind of a full, full example. You know, include the library, initi you know, initialize the object, and I have the, the example macro called clear that you can see does a very roundabout way to set a memory address to zero. And so down at the bottom, I made it really hard to read, just to make sure everyone was paying attention. Um, you can see main equals clear v. And that main equals array is the, the main program. And it just basically says call clear, which returns those, you know, those uh, array elements, and put it in the array. So I can just write clear, comma, then more instructions, comma, another macro, and so on. And then finally, I just call assemble on it, and that'll just do the magic. Well, it's not really that, much, not really that magic. Give me the binary blob that I can just lay down on the stack to actually execute this. So it, this is intentionally uses the simplest um, implementation possible. One, because I wanted to get it working that weekend. Two, because I wanted to actually show um, that it doesn't require heavy lifting, at least on x86 and Windows, to do this. And just to give uh, you know, people an adequate or uh, accurate description of what level of defense ASLR and DEP provide on rich client-side applications where attackers have a, um, a, high, a large, what I call, control surface. Applications like this, where an attacker can run JavaScript, can run plugins, all this cool stuff, there are a, a gazillion avenues that, to, to possibly fix memory at one location or learn where memory is at another, learn where other memory is at another location, and so that makes DEP and ASLR much less effective. So this, um, you know, that's what I wanted to show with this. If you want to see how to do ROP in like a you know, totally fancy way, uh, you should have gone to the, Z the Dynamics talk yesterday, where they have a uh, lot, lot much more academic uh, and much cooler, in my opinion, treatment of this for ARM, in particular for uh, iPhone. So let's talk about, so now we know kind of how to generate return to programs. What are we going to do with that? And the main strategy uh, we're going to use is actually a bridge to execution of a traditional payload. This is like a payload stage. And there's a couple things we can do. One, we, if there's executable memory at a known location, we can just copy our payload to that, that memory and then um, you know, jump there. Or you know, we went, what we might need to do is allocate new readable, writable, executable mem memory and then write the payload there as well. An important thing to keep in mind is even permanent DEP doesn't um, prevent you from allocating new executable memory. If it did, things like JIT would break, and no one likes, you know, no one wants to break Java. Um, another approach you can use is the write process memory trick, which I'll kind of talk about as well. Um, another cooler technique is building your payload in executable memory piece by piece. Um, if there's like, you know, if you can reuse existing data bytes, copy those to the executable memory, and um, and have them assemble into your next payload. So it's kind of cool. Or you can just do the simple trick of if your payload's in non-executable memory, you can just make that executable and then execute it from there. And so I'll kind of show you why, uh, how this bypasses DEP. Um, how DEP works on, on x86 is it uses the, an extra bit on the x86 processors to actually say, no, I really want this page to not be executable. And I kind of refer to this as the I mean it bit. Because you know, the operating system, if you look at a debugger, if you look at you know, various other things, the operating system may say that a page is not executable. But unless the, uh, in the page tables this bit is actually set, the processor won't enforce it. So this is the I mean it bit. It also requires that all modules um, be compiled with the nxcompat flag. And, and yet, there's even more conditions. Um, so even if you have all this, um, you know, with the original DEP, uh, you could basically just turn it all off with a function called NT set information process. And so Scape and Skywing showed just using one simple um, ret return to libc jump, they could just turn it off and then return to their payload, done. DEP is not that big of an issue. Um, so XP Service Pack 3, Vista, and later support permanent DEP, um, which cannot be disabled at runtime. However, permanent DEP requires applications to specifically enable it in many cases. Um, so for instance, uh, if you run IE7 on Vista, like Vista SP1, which has permanent DEP, uh, it won't opt into it. You need to run IE8 
on supporting operating system to actually use permanent dip where you can't do this five-year-old trick. So uh, here's an example of just one way to, uh, one stage you can do this. Or one example stage that will enable a traditional payload. Um, so yeah, like I said, DepNX prevents execution of data, but it doesn't prevent you from making new executable code. Um, if you look at something like uh, Apple's iOS that runs on iPhones and iPads, they actually have a code signing enforcement where you're not allowed to do this. If you try and allocate new executable memory, the kernel will, will know that that didn't come from a, a, uh, a binary that was personally signed by Steve Jobs, um, so it won't let it run. <laughs> um, whereas on Windows, sure, anything goes. So here we're going to go through four basic steps. First, you need to get your uh, stack pointer. Um, you need to find out where you're executing from because we're going to need to patch up memory a little bit. And then we're going to allocate some more memory. We're going to copy our payload in, and then we're going to actually jump to execute it. So um, it's been at least like 10 minutes since I showed a stack diagram, and I know you're all waiting anxiously for the next one. So here you go. You can all relax. So this is the what I call my get ESP. It's not really a gadget. It's kind of a gadget, which will uh, re get the location of ESP and store it. Um, so first thing we'll do is, you know, retrieve a memory address that we're going to store it into. We're going to use my favorite exchange, EAX ESP, because it's, you know, very commonly available, and then store it. Boom. We now have a location of memory that stores our value of ESP, and I'll show you why we actually care later. So we need to, um, if we need to allocate some memory, I think that's actually the wrong comment. Um, oh, no, that's the right comment. Basically, what we're going to, one of the tricks we're going to use is, um, if we want to call a standard library function and there is ASLR, we can just, you know, jump to the location in, uh, like in, NT, in kernel 32.dll because that might be at a random place. However, if we know where DLL A is and DLL A imports uh, one of these functions, we can just pull it out of the import table and call it through that. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So um, we just, you know, use the address of, um, of, you know, that DLL's import of, like, the function that we want, which is virtual protect in that DLL's import table, you know, read it, return, um, then we actually call it and jump to it and basically what it's going to do is, um, you know, we need to kind of give it some arguments, uh, or actually this is going to, we call it virtual allocate to actually get some memory and now we're actually going to store it. So we need to set, you know, the memory address we want to store it in, store EAX into it and boom. We now have a pointer to readable, writable, executable memory. Now we need to copy our payload from, you know, where it exists into that memory. So that, this is why we actually retrieve the value of ESP. That lets us embed our traditional like Metasploit payload or, or whatever right in the stack or our fake stack so that we can pull it out. So we did our get ESP so we can figure out where that payload is. So we load up that variable that we created with the, po the pointer to our ESP, load that up, and now we need to you know, calculate the offset from where we're executing to um, basically to a, uh, actually this is where it's a little complicated, we need to have a dynamic argument. So we need to actually calculate the offset from where we're executing to um, like where the, uh, the argument will be on the stack. So I'll, I'll write down something like dead beef and then in the stack, in the fake stack frame to call the function and then I will um, just overwrite that so I can clearly see that. So we calculate the offset here, we add the offset, um, load up our memory location and then write it directly onto our stack to you know, allow, it, allow us to call a function with a dynamic argument. And we're going to do a similar thing to actually get the location of our payload. So grab the uh, location of um, our memory, do the similar sign of song and dance to kind of um, you know, find our argument and then uh, find the offset to our payload and we're going to call memcopy. Now we have copied our payload into executable memory. All we need to do is you know, set ECX to the, uh, the, you know, the pointer that points to it, dereference that, you know, do a push ret, that'll just simulate a jump right to it, and we now have our payload running. So there's a couple variations on this. Um, one thing we can do is we can, like uh, Pablo Soleil mentioned this in his presentation a few years ago, um, we can create a new heap with the flag heap create enable execute, um, and we can do that. So if, because we're calling things to the import table, if, for instance, virtual allocate isn't available, from, from the module that you know, but heap create is, um, you can just do this. Um, the other one is if virtual protect is, a, is a available, you can just point that to your stack and do that and just make your stack executable and that's kind of actually a lot less code. Uh, some other alternatives 
um, that work in non-ASLR environments were, uh, were documented by Spencer Pratt, of all people, on full disclosure a few months ago. And he had an interesting write process memory technique. So write process memory does an interesting thing. Um, you know, in the, in, the, uh, in the spirit of being a, you know, a little more user friendly, um, if the page you're trying to write to isn't actually, um, isn't actually writable, it'll make the page writable and then write the data to it. And so um, and another thing you can do is write process memory is traditionally used when you're debugging another process. Well, you can just pass an argument to it that specifies this process. And so you'll just use these debugging functions on yourself. And the, the, uh, the key to the trick here is that you know, the data that you're going to overwrite is the code for write process memory itself. So what happens is you know, at the function prolog, right after write process memory has finished writing the data and it's a, you know, it expects that it's going to return, it's now going to execute the code that you've just you know, slammed there. And because most applications won't, won't use write process memory, the fact that you've obliterated its code and kind of made it useless will not affect the application. So that's kind of a, a cool trick. But it gets kind of cooler. Um, and he called it the, the seance technique. So if you don't know the location and memory of your, your shellcode buffer, uh, which is also common because you need, that's why we had to do the get ESP to kind of find where we were. So if you don't know that, you need to do something else. But you can't, but you do know where write process memory is because, you know, and kernel 32 is uh, at a fixed location on a non ASLR system. What you can do is chain a sequence of returns to write process memory to build your shell code in an existing text segment. So you can find some space at the end of kernel 32, for instance, and then find a couple bytes from here, a couple bytes from there, three bytes from there, and then just keep using write process memory to copy them there and go blip, 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 and build your entire payload that way. Um, and that's kind of cool. Um, another, another variation on this is I call it the bring your own borrowed instructions technique where you, what you do is instead of building your next payload, you just write the instruct the uh, so like I said, with the borrowed instruction program, you don't have all the instructions that you need. What you can do is you can you know, copy those bytes to build the instructions that you need in uh, executable memory and then use those to write the, ex the return oriented program that you wish you could. So that's kind of fun. So now if you look at kind of the pieces that I've talked about, we have the stack pivot to uh, use control of EIP to get control of, of ESP. Um, that's the stack pivot. You have a return oriented payload stage that'll bring you to executing a traditional payload. And you have a, a Windows payload, just grab that from Metasploit. You now can by bypass permanent depth with an arbitrary exploit. So that's pretty cool. So let's see how to actually do this um, in practice. So um, the Aurora vulnerability on Windows 7, uh, everyone, know, everyone knew about this. The internet was destroyed, blah, blah, blah. blah. Um, Google actually was on like, you know, the first big companies to actually admit publicly, hey, we've been hacked. You know, we all work in information security. We know all these, a lot of these places have been hacked, but no one can talk about it. But Google said, yeah, we got owned pretty bad and it sucked. So that's actually kind of a, a big step and actually I think will help move the industry forward a bit. But uh, let's talk about the details of the vulnerability here. So the root of the vulnerability was that there was, in MSHTML, there was an event param object. And what this, uh, what this object did is this encapsulated the state for the, uh, the JavaScript event objects. And there was a JavaScript function called create event object. And if you passed it a template object to copy, it would not increment a ref count to an object called a C tree node. And so the way that uh, MSHTML kind of represents the DOM is basically there are C elements and C tree nodes. And so the C element represents the actual HTML element, like the HTML tag and all that stuff. And the C tree node is just represents its position in the DOM tree. And that lets them kind of move things around the tree more efficiently. Um, and so the event param actually had a point, you know, a lot of objects point, don't point to directly to the element, they'll point to the DOM tree, the DOM tree node, which will point to the element and they kind of reference each other. So event param would have a pointer to the C tree node, but because it didn't increment the reference count, I use a dotted line here because instead of being a strong reference, it's a weak reference. And that actually will result in, you know, problems. Um, yeah, so this is basically what I said here. We have the event param has a weak reference to the C tree node. And the C element also points to the C tree node. So we have two pointers to the same C++ object, but only one of them is reference counted, the other isn't. So if you wrote JavaScript to remove the HTML element that, uh, you know, the corresponding HTML element from the DOM, what'll happen is the C element